Okay, here we have uh, second to last uh, section in this um, uh, unit on uh, AI for health and medicine. This comes from a work of a colleague of mine, Shantanu Jha, and uh, collaborators at Argo National Lab, such as Rick Stevens. And it is using high performance computing to screen drug candidates. It has the lessons you'll learn here are applicable to many other projects, which we even uh, summarized some of them in earlier, in earlier slides. This is a very important area. And it has multiple facets, which I'm not fully described here. Okay, let's go. Section H, screening COVID-19 drug. Before we uh, get started on this uh, large Department of Energy project I mentioned in the on the first slide, I will make some general remarks as to why this is pretty important to actually invoke AI and uh, try to improve the drug discovery process. Um, say the work we'll describe shows how deep learning can uh, map molecular structure into drug properties. And uh, it actually also m maps molecular structure to material properties. And it's having huge impact on manufacturing for that reasons. And then deep learning allows simulations to probe molecular structures more efficiently. You go, th I mean, there, there's all, I mean, we have all these 10 to the 23 particles we're running around and um, in a mole. And um, that's a lot of, fa that, that means the molecular structure is very, very rich. There's a large phase space in the physics language I like. So this makes everything very, very complicated. So here we have the drug discovery process summarized. So first step is to find a good molecule. Um, then we need to find, um, well, that's the molecule in involved with the disease. Then we find something that interacts with that molecule. Then we test it on animals and then we test it on uh, humans. And you can see this thing takes a long, long time and costs billions of dollars. So anything we can do to speed it up and maybe to not only discover things quicker, be more accurate in your discovery so you can actually uh, look for side effects because that's also can be, uh, side effects can be learned by deep learning because deep learning can map molecular structure into side effects. And so you can uh, actually um, speed up the later stages we, when it doesn't actually seem to be involved like here, because you'll just be more successful. So if we look at the uh, following slide, it shows the dilemma. And actually that there is beginning to look at a slight improvement. Namely, here is an article from Biostatistics uh, 2019, and it uh, here's years from 2005 to 2015, and it uh, it uh, records the average time for these various steps, these th three phases we saw on the previous slide, and the overall. And we can see actually we we uh, see a uh, um, well here's this black is the, the black squares and the most important they're the total, and you can see they're um, well they're up here they're 10 to 11, 9, 7, 6. Um, they went down to 7% and then they actually jumped in 2015. So there is some slight uh, sign of improvement. And um, that's just this bit here. And the biggest improvement is probably in this area here, which is the first stage. Uh, where it's most directly um, used. And here we have uh, this, the, these uh, plots for um, Overall time broken up by um, by area. So this ch this is the challenge which we have to try to we have to try to accelerate this. I remember being in a meeting maybe 2010 at, at uh, NIH and the drug companies were so depressed they were pouring all these resources into computation and things were getting worse not better. And uh, 
they actually cancelled the project I was involved in, and not because of our project, just because they were so depressed about the whole area. But that area we were working on, which was uh, uh, actually in the map of cheminformatics, the mapping of chemical structure into chemical properties and related to the ability to be a drug, that has really got much better. Tremendous improvement. At the time, when I was in this meeting in 2010, we had no inkling that was possible because deep learning, which is what's uh, done this for us, that was only, that didn't, there were no deep learning activities in that, in this particular area then. So this is very important and pretty recent. So let's get started and see what's going on from this DOE project. So there was a time I remember um, 10 years ago when drug companies were very depressed, they were making no progress, they were, but they were also not using AI. I think nowadays, um, the drug discovery process is much more promising. People have developed these new techniques, which are just far more efficient than previous techniques, but totally brute force. And if we look at the, there are sort of um, at least two types of usages of AI and drug discovery. One takes a molecule. It looks at the properties of the molecule, maybe that 10 properties. Then it builds a deep learning network, mapping that into, um, into the behavior of this molecule in various functions, such as drugs. So this is a standalone deep learning network. That's um, mapping molecular structure into drug properties, or molecular properties into drug properties. Then we have, uh, this has also been uh, very, very important for manufacturing, because you can do the same thing for materials. You can decide whether a particular material built out of the following atomic structure will or will not be a high quality material by using these types of networks. And there are lots of papers in this area, and I've written review articles which give more detail on them. Then there is, um, Perhaps a more interesting, because it's sort of somewhat newer, is to use the AI to control a, a high performance computing simulation and make that simulation more efficient. That is still being developed, and uh, we'll have more, uh, there's more of that than this in what follows. So this is a Shantan New Jars project with DOE. I have no significant involvement with it. And um, it's addressing the fact that there's lots of possible drugs, and we need to enhance the performance of the simulations. The simulations are just running on these giant DOE supercomputers, and they also have to do a lot of hyperparameter searches. I think I remarked, if you compare universities with industry and DOE, industry and DOE do much better because they have, they have the infrastructure to allow hyperparameter searches. Um, and we want to um, predict therapeutic effectiveness, and we want to determine which drug candidates to actually pick out of the possible ones to simulate. And um, here is the example of this deep learning to map um, specification of a, of a possible drug, or, which is a chemical, a small molecule chemical, into its um, therapeutic effectiveness. Here's effectiveness, here is structural properties, and you just learn this network. And you can train this network either on the, um, experimental observations or on simulations. And this is, these are, when you do it with simulations, they're called surrogates, because this is a surrogate for the simulation. It allows you to capture what you wanted out of the simulation without doing it. And here is the, um, Actual, I, I must admit I'm not terribly competent to comment on these slides. I don't quite know what kinase inhibitor resistance is. And uh, I know what mutations are. And certainly the fact that there are a large number of mutations makes it a complicated problem. Here we have the, presumably the protein database. And um, we are automating uh, a, the model 
to try to see which ones are promising models which we feed in to our molecular dynamics simulation. These have produced trajectories as they move, as, as you do the simulation, the um, proteins uh, move through phase space and you, you um, find some clustering of these things to find out where interesting things are happening, which you feed in here to get novel states. Over here, we're doing some um, molecular docking. We're taking the small molecules, letting them uh, hit the uh, virus with its spike and see if they gobble up the spike and destroy the virus. And then you get candidates on that, which are fed and also to this process. And then at the end, you get a list of potential drugs. So this is uh, called Deep Drive MD. Deep learning driven adaptive ensemble. The ensemble means uh, ensemble means collection. So this is a collection of simulations. This is a relatively recent development of um, ensembles have always been used, but they've been used in a rather they've had a rather bad reputation because they just run over everything. Whereas these are in sort of AI driven ensembles. They're they're, they're a much more intelligent search space. So they're making the search over space much better. And they use these so-called convolutional variational autoencoders, which are a good way of getting low dimension representation. So if you have lots and lots of um, atoms, and you're trying to evolve them in time, I don't know whether there are, how many atoms there are, 100,000 or a million. Well, that's, um, each of them has three positions and three velocities. So that's uh, six million degrees of freedom. Well, that's a lot of degrees of freedom to explore. Well, you can um, effectively learn what's called collective coordinates, which are low dimension representations. And this is basically dimension reduction for simulations. And uh, you can actually learn features which are, can go be transferred across simulations. And you can identify from this which region of the phase space actually has interesting molecules. And you can bias your simulations to go into that area. Like they were, they, <clears throat> independent of this, they were looking at protein folding. And they look at the phase space of the simulations where proteins are likely to fold. And all of this runs on these giant supercomputers, running lots and lots of jobs controlled by these autoencoders. And here is a more detailed um, picture. Candle is this giant argon project in um, working in this area, and here but they see they use TensorFlow, um, and they do hyperparameter over here. So they just run over lots and lots of possible hyperparameters. We know hyperparameters are critical. At the moment, what you have to do is to specify the general structure of the um, deep learning network, and then you can choose the number of layers, the number of units in each layer. Um, Mount of the dropout, and also what all these things which um, determine the effectiveness of the final answer, the number of time steps to use in the time series version. And <clears throat> you then take your simulations, you actually terminate early ones which don't look promising, which don't fit with your phase space model, and you continue um, well placed trajectories or simulations, and you also generate new simulations with the uh, um, built around the states which are believed to be promising. You do that with the inference phase, which is where the CVE, the convolutional network, will predict what the right things to look at are. All right, so here is actually a sort of examples. Anton is a very famous specialized computer built by D.E. Shaw, who made uh, billions of dollars in the stock market. He's a computer science at, uh, scientist, I think, at New York University. And uh, he actually worked in the same field as I did uh, in the 80s. But he was successful and I wasn't. And uh, he built Anton, even using one of my best students on his, on his team. And Anton is the... Uh, Orange, and so it's how it's moving through phase space. This is for this uh, VHP uh, 
protein is BBA. I'm not quite certain what they are. And here you can see actually the deep drive MD is exploring the population very badly. That's because it's learning. Once it's learned, it really sprints up and uh, comes on the head of um, Anton. In some cases, it appears to do um, just better from the beginning. I'm not quite certain why that is. Maybe it's already pre-trained. Uh, here is an example where for BBA, where it has a clear training uh, component. So, but in all cases, the blue curve is more rapidly varying with time, which means it's more rapidly understanding the phase space than, and because there's a non trivial factor to get to the same um, degree of um, validity, uh, Anton has to um, run factor of 10 to the 100 longer time. Here's a pretty picture of, uh, of this uh, nasty virus. And they're doing these three different uh, things, which uh, these particular words will occur on the following slides. Um, of this virtual screening pipeline to uh, identify drugs, which are by definition small molecules. Um, we're identifying, um, and that's by because they bind well. And uh, we have uh, physics-based models which identify which small molecules to, to look at. And we have the detailed um, modeling of actually the binding and uh, how the drugs and viruses interact with each other. And uh, here is this virtual screening. You have all the data coming in, PubMed, Chem I'm very familiar with. It just is a set of data on chemicals. And it gives you all the, and then actually this is, that's the type of data. When we had this neural net that went from here to here, PubChem will tell you what to put here. It has all the information about what those chemicals do. I won't discuss these words here because they're the same as the previous slide. And um, so this is AI driven docking. Docking is just modeling how the drug and viruses interact. Here we have um, a workflow one, where we're um, finding particular molecules. Um, and this is running on the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, where the machines are named Theta and Cooley. I don't know Cooley, Theta I know, it's quite well known. It's a big, um, nice landing system. And it's using a well-known molecular dynamics code, Amber. And we finally have um, Workflow two, understanding the detailed interaction between drugs and molecules. And this is running on lots of supercomputers. All of these are. Here's the final slide in this set, which just, uh, these are the software which uh, my friend Shantanu has built. Uh, it's got Radical in front of it, that's the name of his lab at Rutgers. And the whole project, this whole project is called Deep Drive NT. And the Radical software, which was built in a project led by me some years ago, is being used in, in these different ways. There's so-called pilot jobs and Saga, which is a particular way of implementing pilot jobs. Pilot jobs are where you have a generic job and you just populate it. And so you try to, you put into the user hands the ability to, to task various, to assign jobs to tasks. And um, currently it's getting you um, factors of up to 1,000 on Summit. And it's expected to get out factors of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 on larger machines. So that's the end of this uh, discussion. Uh, there's, this is a very deep area. There are many, many papers on this which you would need to study to make further progress. In any case, thank you very much.